Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Dave Deptula, AFA's Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. And I'd like to welcome you all to our fourth 2020 Space Power Forum uh, in our first web-based edition. Our last speaker in the event series was Secretary of the Air Force, Barbara Barrett. And today, we're really pleased to have with us Major General Mike Gutlein, the Deputy Director of the National Reconnaissance Office, and Brigadier General Tom James, U.S. Space Command Director of Operations, or J3, and the Commander of Joint Task Force Space Defense. Now, these are two extraordinarily important positions in two extraordinarily important organizations. Our goal today is to provide our listeners with insights as to their relationships, as well as providing us some insights to their future plans regarding protecting U.S. interests in space. So gentlemen, thank you and uh, welcome for uh, joining us today. Uh, uh, let's get started with General uh, Gutlein giving us an overview of what's going on at the NRO relative to its unique position in our national security space architecture. And then we'll hear from General James about his roles at U.S. Space Command and how the nation's newest combatant command is meeting the challenges it's facing today as well as in the future. So Mike, over to you. Okay, thank you, General Deptula. On behalf of my boss, Dr. Chris Scalise, let me start by thanking the Mitchell Institute for continuing to host the Space Power Breakfast. These events have been critical in shaping the future of the U.S.'s space doctrine. I especially want to thank General Deptula for inviting me back today. This morning, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the partnership between U.S. Space Command, the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Space Force, and the intelligence community. I am honored to be sharing the stage today with my good friend, Brigadier General Tom James, the U.S. Space Command J-3, and the commander of the Joint Task Force for Space Defense. Over the past several years, Tom and I and our organizations have established a very tight partnership. But before I start, let me kick things off uh, by talking a little bit about the National Reconnaissance Office, what we are doing today, and what we will be doing tomorrow. For over 60 years, the NRO, both culturally and operationally, has been used to operating in the background listening to and watching our adversaries from the high ground of space. And we have done this and continue to do this with a complex system of satellites. As several of you know, the NRO is responsible for developing, acquiring, launching, and operating our satellites. This is a different operational model than that employed by the DOD. The DOD separates development and acquisitions from satellite operations. Our space systems collect both geospatial and signals intelligence data to support a wide variety of customers and intelligence requirements. But the NRO is more than just eyes and ears in the sky, and that, that is true more today than ever. As a member of the intelligence community and an element of the DOD, the NRO has the unique role in bridging the IC and DOD customer sets that depend on our vital intelligence data every day. From our national decision makers to our intelligence community partners to the warfighters operating at the tactical edge, we provide the vital space-based intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance support across all domains that is critical to, be, to keeping our nation safe. It is definitely an exciting mission and no one does what we do. And we have achieved a great level of mission success over 60 years, a success that is built on three key qualities. First, we are small, flat, and streamlined. That means we're able to make decisions quickly and adapt to changing needs and requirements. Second, we have end-to-end -end responsibility for our national ISR assets. The nation invested a great deal of national treasure in these satellites and our responsibility spans from research and development through acquisitions to launch and operation, operations and ends with the responsible disposal of the asset at the end of its life. This allows us to innovate quickly and make improvements at every stage of our acquisition cycle. And third, we are constantly developing and improving upon and evaluating new capabilities, technologies and partnerships. For the NRO, we are focused on leveraging our long legacy and these attributes to make sure we can continue to meet the challenges we will face both today and tomorrow. And we are doing that by working to achieve greater spacecraft availability and resilience, accelerating the delivery of intelligence information and data both from satellites and to the end user. We are leveraging machine learning and other advanced analytics to more effectively make sense of large volumes of data and rapidly infusing advanced technologies into our systems to make sure we are postured to meet the challenges of today and tomorrow. It is really an exciting time to be at the NRO because we are thinking about our collection systems in a different way, driving toward a more integrated architecture that accelerates the delivery of data and intelligence information to analysts and to the warfighter. 
To achieve what we have set out to do requires our continued collaboration and unity of effort with our space community, the IC, and our DOD partners. You've probably heard by now that the director of the National Reconnaissance Office agreed that in a time of crisis or conflict, the National Reconnaissance Office will execute direction from the commander of U.S. Space Command through the National Space Defense Center in the Protect and Defend mission. This is a monumental agreement and a testament to how far we've come in our relationship between the IC and the DOD and how well it has matured over the past couple of years and we are jointly getting after the threat together. To be clear, the IC and the DOD certainly have been able to partner in various ways in the past, and there are numerous successes one can point to. The, the NRO itself is a reflection of that strong partnership. Still, it is fair to say that the IC and the DOD efforts have not always been aligned optimally, whether in acquisitions or operations, and our decision makers recognized a few years ago that there was more that could be done and needed to be done to address the emerging threats. Let's return to this certain core functions of the NRO. The NRO is organized and equipped to develop and operate the nation's intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance satellites in support of IC, DOD, and national needs, but traditionally with more of a foundational intelligence focus. Meanwhile, the DOD services are responsible for organizing, training, and equipping our warfighters for space and multiple mission areas, including such sectors as missile defense, communications, and launch, among many others. Against the backdrop of increasing threats and emerging problems, such as the need to strengthen tactical support to the warfighter, we are finding more and more areas of shared interest, and it is clear that we need to continue bringing the, com the communities together in a more synergistic manner, despite some of the historical differences in focus. That is a more efficient way to conduct business and, counter and to counter our threats, especially a proxy war in space. And that is how our potential adversaries are gonna fight, which is what we must do as well if we are to maintain our competitive edge in space. Today, with the span stand up of the Unified Combatant Command for Space and with the stand up of the United States Space Force, we are partnering to ensure that we maintain our competitive advantage in space against rapidly evolving competitors who seek to deny our strategic advantage for space. We are working together to support integrated warfighter and intelligence community needs, all drawing from a shared responsive knowledge base. We are enhancing our common operating picture across all joint operating areas to enable multi-domain operations to include the space domain. And we are distributing strategic, operational, and tactical intelligence products at the speed and need to our customers. The overarching objective is to maintain U.S. strategic advantage in space afforded by integrated capabilities across the continuum of conflict. Today, we are working hard, to get to, working hard together to develop common terminology for decision-making via shared perspectives, we are developing common security constructs and classification levels. We are developing clear command relationships, operational interfaces, and authorities to ensure we achieve unity of effort in every effective manner. We are defining coordination process and capabilities for space domain awareness, indications and warnings, and space defense. And we are developing shared intelligence warfighting capabilities where that makes sense. These efforts will improve our responsiveness and system availability. They will increase the nation's space protection and resiliency. They will better integrate space support into warfighter operations, and they will enhance communication, connectivity, and capability. The journey didn't start with the stand-up of the U.S. Space Command, but it sure has gained momentum. One of our key partnerships with U.S. Space Command, and one way we ensure operational cooperation and collaboration is with the stand-up of the National Space Defense Center, or the NSDC. The NSDC was jointly established between the DOD and the IC and is jointly operated by U.S. Space Command and the NRO and it is a focal point for synchronizing and aligning space operations. Today, General James's warfighters and the Joint Task Force for Space Defense and our Joint NRO and U.S. Space Command team in the National Space Defense Center are at the tip of the spear in the space defense mission and are a model of success for a strong collaboration between the IC and the DOD. Certain, mechaniz certain mechanisms were established to strengthen those partnerships in practice and improve governance and decision-making among the NRO, U.S. Space Force, and U.S. Space Command. To ensure we are getting after these threats in a synergistic manner, a Standing Executive Committee, or XCOM, was established between the Commander of the United States Space Forces and the Director of the National Reconnaissance Office, and they meet quarterly. The key objective of the XCOM is to leverage synergies in the acquisition activities and, where feasible, pursue joint architectures and joint development approaches in support of our respective DOD and IC missions. The XCOM provides strategic, organized, training, and equipped decisions and guidance, including in the area of acquisitions, enterprise agility, and architecture synchronization. 
across both the DOD and the NRO. The key objective of the XCOM is to leverage synergies in the acquisition activities and where feasible pr pursue developmental partnerships in various forms. In addition to the XCOM, the Joint Space Warfighting Forum, or JSWIFT, JSWIFT for short, was established in 2017. The purpose of the JSWIFT is to be the principal strategic forum to ensure that the U.S. is postured for a war that extends into space. The JSWIFT supports and enables synchronized DOD and IC space operations efforts to include advocacy, experimentation, implementation of lessons learned, and the rapid development of concept of operations necessary to ensure persistent U.S. space-based capabilities. Like the Space Enterprise XCOM, the JSWIFT is co-chaired by the Director of the National Reconnaissance Office and the Commander of U.S. Space Command, who just happens to be dual-hatted as the Commander of the United States Space Forces. Members include the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, Commanders of Army Strategic Command, U.S. Fleet Cyber Command, and Marine Forces Strategic Command, to name a few. The most current change to the relationship between U.S. Space Force or U.S. Space Command and NRO was fostered by Space Policy Directive 4, which gave direction to the DOD and the IC from the President to enhance collaboration, increase unity of effort, and improve space operational effectiveness. In response to SPD4, the IC and the DOD are building upon the National Space Defense Center to fully integrate DOD and IC space defense. In crisis or in conflict, the NRO will execute direction from the commander of U.S. Space Command to protect and defend U.S. space capabilities based on jointly developed tactics, techniques, and procedures that were informed by exercises and war games. This does not change the way the NRO operates. The NRO, the NRO will continue to maintain satellite control authority of our assets in space, and the NRO will still maintain the right to self-defense but we will jointly protect and defend the nation's space capabilities. The IC and the DOD will increase cooperation in our space defense architectures, and we will share information about requirements, architectures, and acquisitions in order to identify opportunities for cooperation. The key is that the NRO, the United States Space Force, and the U.S. Space Command will achieve unity of effort. Going forward, the NRO is working hard to strengthen the partnership with the DOD. We are directly engaging U.S. Space Command as a warfighting entity. We are committed to shortening our decision loop to ensure we stay ahead of our competitors and if necessary, can outmaneuver the adversary. And we will continue to work together to improve the responsiveness, availability, and protection of the nation's space capabilities in support of the warfighter by enhancing data flow and connectivity architectures, by identifying future threat, a response approach and working together to improve indications and warnings. And by leveraging commercial research and development to ensure we maintain our strategic advantage from space and stay ahead of our competitors. This isn't the space environment we all grew up in. It is congested, it is competitive, and worse yet, it is contested, as many have observed. But rest assured, the NRO, the United States Space Force, the United States Space Command are getting after it as a team. So General Deptula, I'm excited to be here today at the leading edge of this historical shift in Americans' warfighting capability. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Uh, Tom, over to you. Sir, good morning. And uh, um, thanks for the opportunity to speak at the Mitchell Institute. I want to thank you and the staff for all the help you've given to me and being prepared to do this. This is my first Space Power Breakfast. Um, I've had a few that I tried to schedule in the past and things got in the way. So I'm glad to be here, if not actually there, virtually there. I will tell We're you- glad to have you. With Space Power Breakfast, I assume that you have uh, power bars and probably drink a big glass of Tang. So that's what I have for breakfast this morning. I'm ready to go. Well, very good. Actually, we changed the name from Space Power Breakfast to Space Power Forum just because we don't have scrambled eggs. So <laughs> Dehydrated, yes, sir. You bet. And whoever made the decision to do this at 930 instead of 730, my hat is off to them because I'm two hours behind you. This is really nice. Um, so, so I'm going to talk a few things today. Um, and I will tell you that this morning on the drive-in, I did the very dangerous thing that I changed some ideas in my speech because of an article I saw this morning. I'll talk to that. Well, I think I'm going to talk a little more historical context than I intended, but I think given the words that General, uh, Major General um, Gulan just went through, he gave a very good and detailed, um, and I think uh, well presented, uh, the details of how the NRO and uh, Spacecom and JTF work together. So I'm going to take it a little bit different, but I'll bring those back uh, at the end and then and looking forward to the questions at the end as well. But 
So I'll focus on the critical importance of space to the U.S., uh, a little bit of historical context. Then I'm going to talk and spend a little bit of time on the threat of our potential adversaries and how that's changed the way we approach, approach space in the space domain. And then third, and where I'd like to spend the majority of my time, is talking about the Joint Task Force Space Defense. General Gutlein talked about the 60 years of the NRO, Joint Task Force Space Defense just completed six months. But it's based on uh, decades of experience in the space uh, mission area from across the Air Force, the military components, in the space community. But really my discussion, I think you'll see as we go through this, is focused on the idea of space superiority and its importance to the United States and our, and our allies. Um, I think the first thing I'll say that you should know is that I absolutely love my job, uh, working in space operations more than 20 years, even as an Army officer. Um, it's just an exciting field to be in. It's always challenging. It's, it's never dull. And I'll give you a little bit of an example. Um, and this gets to some of the historical context. I'm in Colorado Springs. Um, I'm not far from the United States Air Force Academy. And last Saturday, they had the United States Air Force Academy graduation. So not even a week um, since that occurred. I wasn't able to attend it, even though I live in Colorado Springs. I watched it virtually. I did get to see the Thunderbirds real time and, uh, and applauded the, the work that they did after. I don't know if you're tracking this, but the Thunderbirds went and flew over many of the medical uh, institutions. Right the state of Colorado, a really uh, good opportunity to salute those that are doing so much work for us and the challenges that we see today on, on the health uh, concerns. But I think the ceremony is worth mentioning to show change, excitement in the mission area and sur surrounding the development of military space, as well as highlighting the necessity of developing our ability with our strategic partners to conduct space operation. I think that was a theme throughout all the speeches there and a couple of things I'd like to highlight. Uh, my boss, uh, the commander of um, the U.S. Space Command and the Chief of Space Operations, General Raymond, uh, noted the historic nature of the graduation and commissioning of over 80 cadets into the U.S. Space Force. That's exciting just to say that. And so on that day, the United States Space Force numbered those 80 plus General Raymond and his senior enlisted advisor, uh, Chief Master Sergeant Toberman. So small but growing fast. Um, but it gets at the historic nature and the, really the um, inflection point that we are in the development of space uh, as a military domain. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Secretary of Defense had prepared clips and they talked about the future of warfare, that the newly commissioned officers would see rapid and radical change in technologies and that would boldly change our doctrine and our strategies into the future. And talked about the environment of great power competition that we find ourselves in today and what that means uh, not just the military, but into the development of space as a war fighting domain. Um, our future is about to change. Our story in the military space community is about how well we meet that change, adapt to that change, and how well we lead turn that change. And that's what the discussion is, I think, to a large degree, about the interaction between Space Command, the Joint Task Force Space Defense, the NRO, and our other partners. I think my favorite story out of the graduation ceremony was from the Chief of Staff of the Air Force. He talked about a lot of important things, but I think maybe the most important to me was his discussion of warfighting culture. He illustrated that in, dis that in discussing the Doodle Raiders and their famous mission, which occurred coincidentally enough on the 18th of April, which was the date of the graduation. Um, and that was in 1942. Um, General Goldfein had the great privilege of speaking with the last living member of the Raiders just before he passed away. And in that conversation, they talked of his mission. He was Doolittle's co-pilot and General Goldfein asked him, after you hit your target and were flying with no beacon, low on fuel, unsure of whether you were over enemy territory or not, what would you wish you had, you know, that you had today that you didn't have then? And he said, he replied quickly and said, one of those GPS things. I mean, it's a great story. Um, it's an exciting time for space. And that brings me to a, a little bit of my experience uh, with space early on as an uh, Army aviator uh, in Desert Storm and Desert Shield. I was an Army Air Scout aviator in an Apache attack helicopter battalion, and we were given a few GPS receivers just in time fielding before we went over the berm. So we didn't get an opportunity to really train with them. We used them uh, in action. Uh, we were a unit out of Germany, and those of you that have been in, in uh, Germany and Europe, um, you know, our unit was extremely good at navigation, navigating with maps. European terrain is generally fantastic for navigating with maps. Uh, you need a good map, airspeed indicator, a compass, and a good clock, and a good idea generally of the wind conditions. 
because of that field you're looking at out of the windscreen of your helicopter has looked the same way since the 18th century. The stone wall you're looking at is 500 years old and the bridge in the valley has been there for hundreds of years. It's very well mapped. Southern Iraq, not so much. Navigation was a supreme challenge to us uh, in, in that fight. But with GPS, it did magic some of the time. It knew where it was with great precision some of the time. And then some of the time, it had no idea at all because it was 1991. We had a partial GPS constellation with gaps in coverage. So in my short time in Desert Shield and Desert Storm, me and my teammates got a taste of having access to space support and seeing the tremendous advantages that it brought and then have it taken away from us and have to continue to fight without those capabilities. So in a very hazardous environment for flying with people trying to do us harm, I learned a visceral lesson at an early time in my career. I saw firsthand the tremendous advantages of having and protecting access to space. I've seen those lessons reinforced over the span of a 30 year career. Most of that is an Army Space Operations Officer. What I gave was an example of positioning navigation and timing, but access to, to space is so much more to include the national capabilities that Major General Bootline addressed. Today, no significant military operations occur that aren't in some critical way tied to space capabilities. Not just military utility, it's how we live as a society, our economy, our financial institutions, the way we receive information and our interconnectedness on a global scale. All that is rooted in space and access to space. Space superiority is, in my opinion, foundational to our national security. And I think that's a change from the way we used to think about space. Um, what else has changed is our emerging threats. Access to space is not a given. Our potential adversaries have watched us integrate space in our military operations, and they've learned. I think they learned two main lessons. First, that space brings a great advantage to operations, and they want that advantage. And second, they look for ways to take that advantage away from us. Most notably, Russia and China are building the capabilities to mitigate onward assets with the development of ground-based lasers, electronic warfare, uh, systems and direct ascent anti-satellite capabilities. Russia's recent direct ascent anti-satellite test provides another example of the threats that the U.S. that face the U.S. and our allied space systems. As General Raymond has noted, this test was further proof of Russia's hypocritical advocacy of outer space arms control proposals designed to restrict the capabilities of the United States while clearly having no intention of halting their counter space weapons program. Actions like these have led the United States to recognize the space domain as a warfighting domain and puts us, as General Ramos often mentions, at an inflection point of national security in the space domain. But the U.S. has responded to this new environment, and it's a lot of the things that Major General Lublin just addressed. Um, we certainly see the, the vital interest of space highlighted uh, in our national security documents, documents an integral uh, part that space plays in our national security. I think one great example, and I'll talk to a little more detail because it affects the Joint Task Force Space Defense directly, is the Unified Command Plan has established space as an area of responsibility of 100 kilometers above the Earth. And the command that, we're, that is responsible for this AOR and for ensuring our access to and freedom of action in space was raised to the level of a geographical combatant command, U.S. Space Command. Again, a geographical combatant command because we have an AOR and, and space that we identify within the boundaries that we protect and defend uh, critical assets. The Joint Task Force Space Defense was established on the same day as U.S. Space Command on the 29th of August, 2019. Uh, the JTF is one of two functional commands in the U.S. Space Command, the other being the Combined Forces Space Component Command in Vandenberg, commanded by Major General John Shaw. The JTF was filled out of the core of the National Space Defense Center, which was established on an experimental basis in 2015. It became fully operational in 2018. So again, it's, it's a lot of new territory that we continue to, um, to work in to understand what should we do, what, how should we organize, how should we train to be able to protect and defend in the space AOR. Today, the National Space Defense Center serves as the operations center for the Joint Task Force Space Defense. The task force consists of over 250 dedicated, uniquely trained space professionals from across the military services, the NRO, and the intelligence community, all operating on the same floor, and that's really where we get our power. 
Our mission is in unified action with mission partners to conduct space superior operations to deter aggression, to defend capability and defeat adversaries throughout the continuum of conflict. But that's all focused on the space AOR. And we talked about deterrence. We look at deterrence to include deterring conflict extending into space domain as our primary goal. We don't want conflict to extend into space. Nobody wins in that fight. We achieve that deterrence through strength, demonstrating that we have the ability to defend our capabilities and defeat an adversary if necessary. We also focus very keenly on superiority and space domain awareness to see and understand our environment, our AOR, and react faster than the potential adversary. I think another way to think about the Joint Task Force um, Space Defense, working with our partners, is with three core functions. The domain awareness for the space AOR that I just mentioned, providing indications and warnings to the enterprise based on our observations of the potential threat activity, and operational command and control of the nation's space superiority capabilities. All of that in unified action with our mission partners, like the strong relationship we have with the NRO. Our recent work is focused on the guidance from the Space Poly Policy Directive 4 that Major General Gutlein mentioned, that in times of conflict, the NRO will take direction from the Space Com Commander to protect and defend on orbit assets. But we've worked closely between us to add pragmatic action to those words, to flesh out how we actually operate to protect and defend against the growing th threats I've described, while continuing to provide critical capabilities to the U.S. and our allies. Um, and then before I wrap up, I wanted to talk just one or two things for that historical context piece. I read an article this morning about um, the hostage rescue attempt. This is the 40th anniversary of the beginning of that operation. Uh, and it was a failed attempt. We learned a lot in that operation. Um, some of the things that did not go well is we didn't have common systems. We didn't have common radio, simple things. The, org the organization that conducted that operation came from different services and different parts of the government, and they had never trained together. There wasn't common um, terminology, doctrine, TTPs. Um, and if you look at that, there's a great book that I read some, some time ago, The Guts to Try, that gets into the details of that operation. You know, we had great people, great courage, um, and in their, in their pockets, they had great expertise, but they had not come together as what we would call today a joint organization and trained and experimented and exercised when we first did that right. And I think that uh, most would say that's the primary reason that we had those difficulties um, in, that, in what was going to be a complicated mission anyway. In another historical example of things going much better than that is um, the most recent anniversary we had of, of Apollo 13, which you know, technically was a failed mission, but it really was a triumph over adversity. And it showed that because there was an incredibly deep understanding of the systems involved in the mission, that there was tremendous trust and experience that had come over a close interaction between the crews, that they were able to take what was an unexpected and potentially uh, a catastrophic failure on the system and bring that crew home. And I have to mention that because one of the members of the NSDC is Mr. Jack Anthony, and some of you probably know him. He did a great uh, um, uh, presentation of that as part of our culture building and our organization of, of success and building trust and all of that. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that the building that I operate in for part of the time um, during my day is the Swigert Building, named after Jack Swigert from the Apollo 13 mission. Um, after the, the failed mission to, um, hostage rescue attempt, um, uh, the Iranian hostages, it wasn't long after that we had another opportunity um, in military operations um, to work across the services in Operation Urgent Fury in Granada. We saw a lot of the same problems. If you remember that uh, the Navy radios couldn't talk to the Army, there's the great story of either Marine or Army Fire Support Officer who couldn't raise the ships to get the fire support that he needed. So he used his credit card to call back, I think, to the situation room and was connected to the Navy ship and then controlled fire through AT&T um, to get those fires in place. So great innovation, great understanding of the, of the mission, had to work through things that should have been at a higher level, worked out, exercised, commonality in systems, commonality in approach, the way that we operate together. Unfortunately, he paid his phone bill, so he was able to get his mission done. Uh, we have to be able to get past those types of things. And so 
I think what we learned from that is that we have learned from that. You know, the Goldwater Nichols came out of the following those two operations of how do we operate as a joint element, stood up the combatant commands, gave the organized training and equipped missions to the services or services, and that's how we operate today. And it's certainly what the NRO, the Joint Task Force Space Defense, and the way that we operate with Major General Bootline and crew is all designed on learning those lessons and the value of exercising, experimenting, getting our, our approach common enough that we can, we know what we're going to do in terms of crisis that we're not having to learn um, in the middle of crisis. And that we've done that well enough that when unexpected comes, we can respond to that as an organized and a partnership to defeat the adversaries that want to take our advantages from space away from us. So the work we do with NRO today is establishes the groundwork I think not only of how space common NRO will operate in the future, but how we'll operate with other organizations in the space domain. Our great teaming with the NRO is really only just beginning in this environment. It remains critical work for our nation and will only grow in importance as we move into the future. I look forward to those challenges and I look forward to your questions and discussion. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you both gentlemen for those uh, insights. Let's uh, jump right into uh, digging the topic, uh, digging into the topic a little bit more with some questions that have been sent in from our listeners. Now, both of you mentioned the growing part partnership between Space Command and NRO. Uh, could each of you give us a couple of examples of where the NRO and uh, U.S. Space Command have collaborated under this uh, new and expanded partnership understanding? Uh, like uh, General James said, that uh, uh, he's only been in that function about six months. Over to you. So let me start right. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Awesome. So we both bragged a lot about the NSDC. That is, is by far our biggest accomplishment together. And, and uh, it's really changed the way we approach war fighting in space. Another element that uh, we're jointly uh, attacking is uh, uh, shared situational war uh, awareness and indications of warnings. So one of the executive committee initiatives highlighted under SPD4 is an NRO-led collaborative acquisition program known as Silent Barker. Uh, Silent Barker will meet the NROs and the DOD's indications and warnings and space situational awareness requirements. While the specifics of the program are classified, it is a merger between two programs, one that was started on the DOD side and one that was started on the IC side. By combining the NRO and the Air Force's investment into one program, the savings can be repurposed into building a larger initial constellation. Under the Silent Barker uh, Memorandum of Agreement between the United States Space Force Commander and the Director of the NRO, the Director of the NRO with participation from the Air Force Acquisition Executive uh, is the Milestone Decision Authority and the program follows the IC's acquisition processes. The Air Force and the NRO each will retain their own budget authority and the Space and Missile Systems Center in Los Angeles will provide support and space domain awareness expertise in support of the acquisition of the Silent Barker program. In order to document the requirements, the Silent Barker program follows the IC's Statement of Capabilities, or SOC process, to satisfy both the DOD's and the IC's requirements. So that's both for TOM's requirements, as well as the IC analyst requirements. The NRO and the Air Force will each budget and, pr and program for 50% of the costs associated with fielding a capability that satisfies the SOC requirements, including acquiring, launching, operating, and maintaining the Silent Barker space vehicles, payloads, and associated ground elements. For testing, Silent Barker program will, will utilize the NRO's development and operational test processes, working together with two organizations. Uh, we're building a capability that meets both our needs and doing it without duplicating effort. This is a huge win for the nation. Uh, in addition to the Silent Barker program, the NRO and US Space Command are also partnering on a playbook for future space conflicts that will actually define how we fight in and through space. But I'll let General James brag about that great work uh, going forward. Hey, Joe James, you need to turn on your mic, please. Or I'll talk extra loud. Yes, sir. Yeah, there you go. So, so there's uh, several different uh, wargaming events that we we'll participate in um, that either uh, bilaterally with the NRO, but most of these are really much larger than that across the space community. One is Thor's Hammer, which is an NRO war game that the JTF participates in. It explores the ability of the national space, uh, security space architecture, to look at cross-domain operations to support U.S. and allies, both in information requirements and how we operate um, in the space domain through the spectrum of conflict. 
It's focused on improving the NRO and our partner support to U.S. and allied senior leaders and fighters. Um, but again, it's not, it's, it's much larger than just uh, the JTF NRO, but we use those opportunities to really flesh out um, the, uh, the unity of effort mechanisms that we have in place uh, to partner. Shreve War Games, and I believe most of your audience is probably familiar with this, uh, led by now the United States Space Force, is focused on our allies, very much uh, coalition focused. Um, and a whole of government approach from across the IC community to include Department of State, the Department of Commerce, obviously a big role that we work now with the Department of Commerce as they move to uh, space traffic management as a mission. Um, and across the entire joint community. Um, so we look at what, what are dangerous actions that we think we see in the space domain, uh, and then how do we reinforce, reinforce responsible actions in space through policy and law using a whole and nation approach. And that war game allows us the opportunity to bring everybody together, then visualize and develop common architectures, uh, to fight together better in future conflict and to inform people and processes and technologies to advance U.S. space comms joint combined operational missions. Uh, and I've heard uh, Shriva War Games uh, characterized this way a lot. It's, it allows like-minded spacefaring nations to explore opportunities and challenges of national, commercial, and coalition architectures to synchronize effects to protect and defend the space enterprise. And I think one thing that we've learned in those operations um, from the Joint Task Force and interaction with the NRO um, is at the SpaceCom level, and a lot of this is through General Shaw's element at the Combined Force Space Component Command at Vandenberg, is we have access to commercial industries through their commercial um, integration cell, plus the other uh, mechanism and, and ways that we do the, the uh, capability development acquisitions. But for the operational aspects, we have direct linkages into the commercial industry and a very robust connection to coalition uh, and allies that is growing. And so it allows an opportunity to be able to communicate, communicate across all of those organizations and different partners um, in the area of protecting and defending the space domain. Okay, great. Those are some excellent examples of cooperation. Um, what are some of the hurdles that uh, each of you see in the future um, that are gonna have to be worked on a bit? Yes, sir. That's a, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, while we're cooperating more than we have at any time in the past, we still have several challenges we are wrestling with, wrestling with, such as overcoming the legacy of the cultural differences between the DOD and the IC, as well as between SMC and the NRO. Uh, these two communities uh, have traditionally had two very different approaches to the problem sets we face and operate in vastly different environments and on very different timelines which can complicate getting the valuable intelligence information data and analysis from the IC to the commanders and warfighters operating at the tactical edge in near real time. One of the NRO's priorities driving forward uh, toward a solution for this challenge is our integrated architecture that will help accelerate the delivery of data we collect to both the warfighter and the IC analysts, making sure they get the data they need when and where they need it as fast as they need it. Another challenge that we are getting after is, is ensuring our systems are, are designed to operate in and through the contested environment. Uh, who has the responsibility for defending which elements of the space enterprise and how? This is something Tom and I spend a great deal of time on. Uh, we meet every two weeks on this subject alone. Uh, in fact, we're in the process of developing a joint uh, protect and defend con ops to help uh, guide the future investments and operations. Another challenge we're getting after uh, is, our partner, is our partnership continues to expand is how do we get to a set of governance standards, uh, common technical and data standards? Uh, this is something we are jointly, jointly working with U.S. Space Forces and with Lieutenant General J.T. Thompson at the Space Missile Systems Center. Over. General James? Yes, sir. So I, that's great comments. And the resiliency in our, our architecture is absolutely something we're working through. And then um, uh, certainly hurdles in, in how we manage the classifications of some of our capabilities. That's what can, it's an area that's been highlighted by uh, General Hyten and General Raymond and others that we have to continue to, to work between ourselves, between NRO and DOD, and then with our, our coalition members, with the commercial industry, with the rest of uh, the military, so that we're able to um, maximize uh, the participation to do synchronization for full effect. I mean, a big part of what, what we do um, from the SpaceCom aspect is we integrate with other combatant commands 
to understand how we protect their space assets and capabilities and how they can help us in our fight for protecting and defending in the space domain, because it, it is absolutely a global integrated um, effort. Um, but to do that, you have to have at the classification level that you can talk meaningfully um, with the right people uh, to get that planning to, to, um, to where you can get the effects that you're after. And so that also gets into the ability to give awareness of uh, the space domain. How do we share that with other folks, either through systems, machine to machine, um, some of this, the bureaucratic process that we have to get through the policies that allow us to share the timing and tempo that we have to, to be able to operate effectively. Um, and I think that one, th one area that we will continue to, to continue to press on is space domain awareness. I mean, we have the best space domain awareness of any nation on the planet, but it's never enough. We need more. And as the space domain continues to grow as a contested environment, I think that's one of the areas that we'll have to continue to push. And that's a hurdle we've got to get through to do that at the, at the speed um, to meet the development and deployment of our, our capabilities now and plan in the near future. Now, so much is, <clears throat> excuse me, so much has been in the news recently about the stand-up of the U.S. Space Force. Um, what do each of you think regarding the organizational, operational, and pragmatic impacts of the creation of the uh, Space Force and, and your respective organizations? Mike? You know, sir, I get this question a lot, and I was actually looking forward to getting it today, so I appreciate that. Um, I've had 29 uh, years in the Air Force, and I bleed blue like none other. Uh, I wanted to be in the Air Force since I was three years old. My mom thought I would uh, get rid of that idea as I grew up. I never did. Uh, but times have changed, and space is threatened like it's never been before. We needed to respond, we needed to adapt, and we needed to change. Our nation relies heavily on space for communications, navigation, and even exploration. I agree with General Goldfein, General Raymond, and General Hyten. Now was the right time to stand up to the Space Force and U.S. Space Command to address these threats and ensure we can protect and defend our assets in space. We're already seeing the dividends of having a force dedicated to protecting uh, and defending space. Uh, there has been a renewed focus in space and an explosion of innovation in the commercial sector. The NRO's mission is to build ISR capabilities that meet the needs of all of our users, from the policymakers to the analysts to the warfighter. NRO acquisitions meet both the DNI and the DOD's requirements, both uh, through the ICR process as well as the DOD's JROC processes, ensuring we provide capabilities that support key stakeholders in both the IC and in the DOD. For the NRO, the acquisition process means we can make sure our capabilities meet the needs of the nation. We are closely working with the Space Force to share these lessons learned under this new concept and share best practices as they, as, uh, they build their acquisition process going forward. So I would uh, go back to the discussion about the Iranian hostage crisis. And I think that one thing that came out of that eventually was the development of the United States Special Operations Command because they saw the need to bring all the services together, the services that train and that are organized and equipped, but they didn't have the element to command and control those forces at a joint level and to integrate, synchronize. And that's what Space Command brings to um, the space domain and that warfighting piece. The Space Force gives you that dedicated, singularly focused service on the doctrine development, on the training, the recruiting um, of the forces, uh, very unique special skill sets, um, and, and the development of those individuals with the right warfighting culture, uh, the balance of the technologies, the deep technologies that you'll have to have to be successful in that space fight, to um, advocate for and develop uh, acquire and fill the systems that we need with the right uh, types of trained crews um, and not just not just for space command but for combatant commands across um, uh, the US uh, military for their space needs but really focused I think heavily in the space command and we look forward to the opportunities to work with Space Force as they can develop from the great work that Air Force Space Command did before but I think the development of the US Space Force really gives that that singular focus on the new domain of space and develop as it will find it. Uh, very good, both. I'd also add that uh, speaking of advocacy, advocacy for more resources into this vital domain. Um, while you've got the mic, General James, um, uh, could you please uh, describe for our audience a uh, little bit more detail on the role of the Joint Task Force of Space Defense? Sure. I would be uh, delighted to do that. I mean, it's a really unique organization. I think I've talked about the power of the fact that you've got 
um, the IC, the NRO, um, different parts of the DOD, multiple military services, uh, bringing in their capabilities. Because what we've seen in the past as uh, space has developed, I think tremendous expertise in different cylinders, cylinders of excellence. I said I wouldn't use that word, but there it is. Um, of, of people that are really developing, focused in their area, but not having that ability to integrate at the time of tempo. And what we've seen from different different operations in the real world, uh, having all of that on the same floor where you can reach across and tap someone on the shoulder versus trying to get them on a phone and look at a screen together and understand a problem with the timing and tempo of a direct ascent anti-satellite weapon, for example, and, and be able to collaborate there in operations real time is tremendous. And I think that's a big part of what uh, the purpose of the NSDC and the JTF space of defense does. But that's for the ops of the future. It's also the element where you can do the experimentation, uh, the brain power to look and determine what are the capabilities, where are our gaps at? and help lead the acquisition and combat development in that because you've got all the right different elements there together as well. You know, principles of war, we talk about, you know, the first one is mass, if you follow the normal acronym for the principles of war. And you're like, well, how do you do mass for space? And in my mind, JTF space defense is part of the principle of mass because you've brought so much intellectual power, so much of uh, uh, situational awareness and understanding into the same place and you've masked all of that together in a way that you can operationalize. And I think that's a real benefit and one of the primary roles. And it gives a place uh, for other organizations to come and build and work uh, in a better understanding of protecting and defending the space AOR. Thank you. Uh, General Gutlein, the National Reconnaissance Office is issuing contracts for commercial imagery sources. About four months ago, the NRO issued a couple of contracts to explore integrating commercial synthetic aperture radar and RF into the NRO architecture. Uh, and the director of the NRO Commerce uh, Commercial Systems Program Office said that the NRO is interested in better understanding the capabilities of uh, commercial uh, vendors. Um, how do you see the future of such commercial integration and, and do you see a substantial opportunity ahead for innovative commercial capabilities? Absolutely, sir. Uh, commercial imagery is an integral part of the current and future architecture of the NRO, especially for our geo-ink collection. That's the ones that collect the, the, the exquisite pictures from space. Our customers' requirements are changing. They need both high resolution and rapid revisit. They need greater persistence uh, and spectral diversity. Commercial imagery can help satisfy these diverse needs. And we're seeing a lot of advancements uh, in the work being done in these new areas. And as uh, Tom said, uh, uh, our AOR starts 100 kilometers and up. That's a lot of space up there. There's a, there's a great need for a, an enormous amount of sensors and the commercial uh, industry can help fill that gap. Now overall, the acquisition of these capabilities is driven by the receipt of validated requirements from the GEOINT Functional Manager, which is the National Geospatial Agency. That's our user for these pictures. So if those requirements include a need that can be provided through commercial class radar, then the NRO will respond with their corresponding procurement strategy. Our strategy for commercial services and products in general can best be characterized as buy what we can, build only what we must. And the NRO remains committed to fully embracing uh, commercial capabilities across all NRO uh, mission areas and the innovation that they can bring to the table. Over. Yeah, awesome. I'm sure our uh... Uh, listeners in the audience with uh, ties to a commercial space-based capability um, um, look forward to the opportunity to work with the uh, NRO uh, in the future. Now, here's one for uh, both of you to put your thinking caps on a, a bit uh, and maybe uh, take a look into the future. Um, if each of you could get a hold of, gain, or acquire a new capability, what would it be? So I think uh, in the future, our adversaries are going to continue to advance their threats. And there's a lot of space up, up there that we need to defend. Uh, this means we will continue to build and require more and more sensors. Uh, and we will continue to pull down large sums of data. And we'll need to help calling through all this data and making sense of it. We'll need to understand patterns of life. And we need to be able to rapidly discern intent. Uh, we are going to need a lot of help to do this. I think one of the most important areas we're investing in in the NRO includes artificial intelligence and machine learning to maximize the performance of our next generation space systems and meet the dynamic threat requirements. 
from data collection to target identification, artificial intelligence and machine learning and other advanced technologies can save analysts time and accelerate the delivery of information to our warfighters. Tom? Yes, sir. And if I could, before you do that one, just on the commercial imagery discussion we just had. Yeah. I have to talk this because I've lived this uh, downrange, working with uh, forces trying to get information that they could easily share with coalition partners, allies, incredible value in that. And as Major General Gutwein it's also mentioned, it's also a resource. We've got exquisite capability and maybe we've got commercial that's not quite as exquisite that we can use and we don't tie up those other resources and it fills the need. And that's another part of what, from the Space Command's perspective, again, the commercial integration cell uh, at Sipsica and Vandenberg, they work hard on looking at all those types of commercial uh, capabilities and integrating it uh, to make that part of a holistic uh, approach. And I will tell you that in numerous exercises we've done, where we've, we, and we've played the loss of some of our uh, exquisite national capabilities, I think we've done a good job of looking at how we can fill those holes quickly and commercial is part of that resiliency in so many different ways. I just, I'll pile on to what Major General Blue said. Yeah, I know that's, uh, that's an excellent uh, observation, Tom. So how about your uh, most desired next capability? You know, so I, I just thinking through some of that, you know, the, the effort that uh, the joint community has now with joint all demand, domain command and control, how do we fit into that in the future? Because a big part of what we've got to do is not just have the capabilities and it's not just the space domain awareness. It's how we can rapidly share that and turn that into decision quality information, the timing and tempo we need for senior leaders to be able to make those decisions. And even not at the senior level, all the way down into what I would call the foxhole level in our space war fighting domain, wherever that may be to have shared understanding. And I've had good glimpses of where we put some of those uh, beginnings of that type of sharing in place uh, with command and control systems and situational awareness on the fight. And, and there's gold there. We've got to continue to press on that hard. And as the joint community moves forward, we've got to be part of that. So that's something that I would, I would push hard for as a capability. I talked about space domain awareness, uh, an area that we'll continue to push for both terrestrial based and on orbit based. Um, uh, General, Major General Gutlein talked about AI and machine to machine learning. I think that has to be the future of how we operate uh, as we move forward to be able to move the timing and tempo that we need to. Um, but I would say the last thing is probably the most important to me is just our people. It's how do we continue to recruit and train and develop. I'm really excited about the Space Force to see how General Raymond and his team uh, talks about changing the culture. Uh, to get the right types of people in, and then how do we train those? How do we get into collaborative environments that'll allow us to train the way we're going to fight and to learn and experiment? One of the things we're doing at the JTFSD is we're building a, a shadow op cell to allow us to experiment now with systems that we think we'll have in the near future and to really get after that. I'd like to see a focus on virtual training, virtual collaborative training that allows us to do that across the community with all of the interested stakeholders uh, in a way that, that is absolutely meaningful to the way that we want to shape and see space developed as a domain. Well, those are uh, uh, music to my ears. I'd tell you, and I think you know this, uh, Mitchell Institute has been advocating for accelerating the means to achieve the ubiquitous and seamless sharing of information in the future as sort of the next big thing, uh, or at least a basis for the next big thing. And the contributions of both the National Reconnaissance Office and US Space Command are fundamental to achieving that vision. So thank you both for that uh, great uh, discussion and uh, insights into your organizations and how you work together in the future. Uh, the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies and AFA wish you all the very best in this era of uh, ever increasing challenges. Um, our next Space Power Forum will feature the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General John Hyten, on uh, 8 May. And uh, we hope that everyone will join us for that event. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity.